All right, burgeoning viewers, one quick note for you. A subscriber a day in October, if we hit 31 subscribers in 31 days, one lucky subscriber will walk away with the entire Modern Horizons art card series. Additionally, a comment a day, any subscriber that leaves a comment in every video posted by MTG Burgeoning during the month of October will become eligible for the November Pack Wars. On November 1st, a list of all subscribers that left a comment on every MTG Burgeoning video during the month of October will be compiled, and from this list, one subscriber will be randomly chosen to participate in the November Pack Wars. So hope for peace, but prepare for war. <laughs> Welcome back, MTG Burgeoning Community. We are back with another Build a Deck Tuesday as we continue with building Riku of Two Reflections. Thank you for returning. If you're not a member of our community, you can quickly remedy that by just clicking that subscribe button. What do you got to lose? All right, so we're going to give a quick rundown of the cards that we've already included in our Riku of Two Reflections EDH Commander build. Anyone who's unfamiliar with Riku... He's two and a teamer for a 2-2 legendary human wizard. And whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, we may pay an is it. And if we do, we copy that spell and we may choose new targets for the copy. And whenever another non-token creature enters a battlefield under our control, we may pay a Simic. And if we do, we put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield. So that is our commander and who we're building around. And just a quick summary of the first 12 cards that we inserted into the deck last week. Earthcraft, Tooth and Nail, Rite of Replication, Doubling Season, Warp World, Genesis Wave, Sneak Attack, Intuition, Snapcaster Mage, Skull Clamp, Druid's Repository, and Exploration. Those were our first 12 added to this Riku of Two Reflections EDH Commander deck. And it was up to the community to select the next 12 cards that were going to be entered. We were trying to have a focus on creatures that, when they enter the battlefield, create burst token generation. And we have those 12 right here. And let's start off with the number one inclusion into this deck, Avenger of Zendikar. For five and two green, when the Avenger of Zendikar enters the battlefield, we create a zero one green plant creature token for each land we control. And then it has the landfall ability that whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we put a plus one plus one counter on each creature we control. I'm sorry, each plant creature we control. This is the perfect example of what a creature that we want to copy with Riku. We want to look to load up our battlefield as we talked about last week. And you can click on any of the links below in the description to bring you up to speed if you don't know exactly where this deck is focusing and what its theme is trying to be. But this is the perfect creature to populate our board with tons of tokens, giving us all kinds of advantages to use with Earthcraft, to use with a Warp World, and this is our creature number one to copy with Riku. Add a green and a blue, and we double our plant tokens. Riku is awesome with Avenger of Zendikar. Creature number two, the Avenger of Zendikar returns. Kind of. We have Phylath, World Sculptor. For four red and a green, we had a 5-5 five, five legendary. Now, that's where we got into a little bit of trouble. I was trying to prioritize non-legendary creatures so that the creature would stick around due to the legend rule. However, Phylath's ability is too strong to not include just by the restriction of it being legendary. So it's okay if we have to part with the original card or the token or however it is we choose to which one will die we still gain its enter the battlefield trigger and that's what's more, most important because when Phylath World Sculptor comes into play, we create a 0-1 green plant creature token just like the Avenger for each basic land we control. Now, that's not as good as the Avenger, of course, but we will have a swath of basic lands included in this deck. So that should not be too much of a hardship. 
to include an additional creature similar to Avenger of Zendikar, I think that warrants Phylath's inclusion in this deck list. It also has a landfall mechanic that whenever a land enters a battlefield under our control, we can put four plus one plus one counters on target plant we control. So if we line up the Avenger of Zendikar with Phylath, we see that there's a great deal of synergy if these two are in play at the same time. Because for the Avenger of Zendikar, it says we put a plus one plus one counter on each plant creature we control. It doesn't specify that they have to be Avenger of Zendikars. So with his landfall ability, we can pump up Phylaths and vice versa. With Phylaths ability, we can put four plus one plus one counters on an Avenger of Zendikar plant token. These two guys are prime, primo choices for a Riku of two Reflections copy trigger. Creature number three, Chancellor of the Forge. Four and triple red is a 5-5 five, five giant, and if we have this card in our opening hand, we may reveal it. And if we do, at the beginning of our first upkeep, we can put a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token with haste onto the battlefield. Trust me, that's not the reason why he's in our deck. It's that second wall of text that's so much more intriguing. When Chancellor of the Forge enters the battlefield, put X, 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens with haste onto the battlefield, where X is the number of creatures we control. This is great following any one of these two creatures. Chancellor of the Forge is a fantastic creature to target with an entwined tooth and nail and have its ability go on the stack first so that it copies, not that it copies, so that it can take into effect the creatures that come into play, such as an Avenger of Zendikar. Getting all of those plant tokens into play and then having the Chancellor of the Forge's ability trigger, oh baby, is that going to create you an entire army real quick. So those are the top three burst creature to burst token creature producers that we've added to this deck. And here's number four. Deranged Hermit. For three and double green, you get a 1-1 one, one Elf with Echo. It's been many, many moons since we heard Echo. I mean, we're going back, jeez, this has got to be more than 20 years ago. Echo, for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, means that during our next upkeep, after this permanent comes into play under our control, we pay its casting cost again, or we sacrifice it. When Deranged Hermit comes into play, we put four squirrel token creatures into play. They're 1-1 one, one green creatures, and all squirrels get plus one, plus one. Even if we choose to not pay the echo, which we most assuredly won't, because investing 10 into this guy is not worth it. However, investing five into him to get us four bodies, that is a very, very good ratio of investment to return. And that warrants Deranged Hermit's inclusion as a top five, top four card with this subset of the deck. So good is Deranged Hermit that Modern Horizons decided to make another one, sort of. Number five is Deep Forest Hermit. For the exact same casting cost of three and two green, Echo was replaced by Vanishing Three. And when a creature has Vanishing, it means that when it enters the battlefield, it has three time counters on it, because that's Vanishing 3, of course. At the beginning of our upkeep, we remove a time counter from it, and when the last is removed, we sacrifice it. So we got two full turns out of Deep Forest Hermit before he gets sent to the graveyard. And when he enters the battlefield, similar to, der to Deranged Hermit, Deep Forest Hermit creates four 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature tokens. Squirrels we control get plus one, plus one. The deranged hermit just makes all squirrels get plus one, plus one. It may be unlikely that we're sitting at a table where other players are playing squirrels, but it's a little more reassuring to know that he's only going to bump our squirrels and nobody else's. Deranged hermit was good enough for number four. Deep forest hermit is good enough for number five. All right, rounding out the top six. Staying on task, on target, with this mana investment to return, we come across Siege Gang Commander. Three and two red. When this 2-2 goblin enters the battlefield, we create three 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens. And then we can tap one in red and sacrifice a goblin, and Siege Gang Commander deals two damage to any target. 
So Siege Gang Commander sticks around for the five mana invested, and it produces in a total of four bodies, itself and the three goblin tokens. So that's the same exact investment of mana in return with Deep Forest Hermit and Deranged Hermit, if we consider that we're not paying the Echo for Deranged Hermit, and we only have Deep Forest Hermit for a couple of turns. So Siege Gang Commander fits right in to that subset of creatures. All right, rounding out our bottom six, we have the Hornet Queen. And this was a suggestion made by one of the MTG burgeoning subscribers in our community. Thank you. This is a great creature to add and a great example of what we're looking to do. Four and triple green, we get a 2-2 two -two flying death touch that when it enters the battlefield, it creates four 1-1 one -one green insect creature tokens with flying and death touch. So for an investment of seven mana, we're creating six power and six toughness stretched across five bodies all of which fly and all of which have death touch combat deterrence for our opponents this creature is and another great creature to make a copy of with riku of two reflections cynic ability so that's another burst token creature generation all right next we have the mere battle sphere same amount of mana same amount of overall creatures a lot different with the abilities and what the creatures are of course so mere mere battle sphere is seven it's an artifact creature and it's a four seven body and when it enters the battlefield we put four one one colorless mere artifact creature tokens onto the battlefield and whenever mere battle sphere attacks we may tap x untapped mirror we control and if we do Mere Battlefield gets X gets plus X plus zero till end of turn, and then it deals X damage to defending player. So again, we're getting the investment of seven mana, and we're getting back five total creatures. This time, it's the power being seven and the toughness being 11 stretched across five bodies. Now, they're not going to win any prizes for combat deterrent <laughs> or for, you know, staring down a massive threat. However, with enough copies of Mere Battlesphere in play, one particularly from a Riku of Two Reflections, a Simic ability, getting more and more colorless Mere to tap for Mere Battlesphere's attack trigger, well, that could potentially lead to a win condition. And that justifies Mere Battlesphere's inclusion into this deck. All right, so we're two thirds of the way done with our creatures that are gonna give us our burst token generation. And the next four are not creatures that are going to create a great deal of creatures when they enter the battlefield. In fact, they're not gonna create any creatures at all when they enter the battlefield. However, their abilities allow for the potential of burst token creation. So let's get an example out here right away. The Dragon Lair Spider. All right, so for two, two red and two green, we got a five, six reach. And whenever an opponent casts a spell, we can put a one, one green insect creature token onto the battlefield. So it doesn't do anything when it enters the battlefield. And if we conservatively think that during a round of turns, if our opponents cast, say, maybe two spells per turn and a round of turns pass, well, we netted six insects. I think that's pretty darn good for an investment of six mana. I mean, we got a five, six reach minimally. And if our opponent decides to take it out with some spot removal, it leaves an insect behind. So Dragon Lair Spider can be sneaky good if left unchecked for multiple turns during our, for multiple rounds of our opponent's turns. Similar to anticipating our opponents leaving a creature or two on the battlefield during turns, during upkeeps, we have Dragon Brood Mother. Now for two, three red and a green, we have a four, four flying dragon. And at the beginning of each upkeep, we can put a one, one red and green dragon creature token with flying and devour two into play. Now, if anyone's unfamiliar with the devour mechanic, as the token comes into play, so as our dragon comes into play, we may choose to sacrifice any number of creatures. And when we do, it gets twice that many plus one, plus one counters on it. So if we put a 1-1 one, one red dragon into play with Devour 2 and we sack three tokens, well, it's getting six plus one, plus one counters. And all of a sudden now, well, now it's a 7-7 seven, seven flyer. 
and that happens at the beginning of every single upkeep. So during a round of turns, we got four, minimally, we got four 1-1 one, one red and green flying dragon creatures in play. And that's if it's a four-player game. We have multiple copies of Dragon Broodmother in the play. Boy, can that get out of control in a hurry. Dragon Broodmother is another example of needing those turns, similar to Dragon Lair Spider, to help us generate more and more tokens to use for Rico, to use for Earthcraft, to use for a Warp World. Speaking of Warp World, a wonderful segue for our last two creatures in today's video, these two creatures both have landfall abilities that when a land enters the battlefield, we put a creature token into play. Now, that could be sporadic, of course. It's not as automatic as our enter the battlefield creatures, and it's not going to be as automatic as our upkeep or whenever our opponents cast spells creatures. So yes, these, couple, these next couple creatures are going to be a little more sporadic with their token generation. However, if we hit one of them off of a warp world or a sizable genesis wave, we're going to see the value of what these two creatures what these two creatures provide. So let's start with Amnoth, the Locus of Rage. For three, two red and two green, it's a 5-5 five, five elemental. It's unfortunate that it's legendary, but we're not looking to copy him, okay? We're staying clear of copying Amnoth because it would be a waste, because when he enters a battlefield, he does nothing. <laughs> the copy just forces us to waste mana and choose a creature to die. However, its landfall ability says that whenever a land enters the battlefield on our control, we put a 5-5 five, five red and green elemental creature token onto the battlefield. Whenever Omnoth or another elemental dies, we lightning bolt anything. Okay, so if we can imagine, conservatively, we cast a warp world with 20 permanents in play. We shuffle up our library and we reveal 20 cards off the top of our library. And if our land base is, you know, the usual 35 to 38 lands, we can consider that every four cards, every three to four cards and 10 will be lands. So if they all enter the battlefield at the same time, Omnoth is going to trigger. And if we're putting six to eight lands into play off of a warp world, Omnoth is creating a quick six to eight elemental creatures that are 5-5. Five, five. That's not bad at all. And with a haste enabler, boy, that could be a game ender. So Omnoth's inclusion in the deck is justified based upon its landfall ability and what it can do off of some of our choice game ending instants. I'm sorry, game ending sorceries like Warp World, like a Genesis Wave. And our last creature for today is the Rampaging Baloths. Four and two green, we got a six six trampler that when a land enters the battlefield under our control, we create a four four green beast creature token. So again, everything that we said about Omnoth Locus of Rage can be attributed to Rampaging Baloths. It's great to see it come into play from a warp world. It's great to see it come into play from a Genesis wave. It's even great to make multiple copies of and then get some lands in play and create all kinds of beast creature tokens. Okay. And that is our next 12 creatures, next 12 cards that we're adding to our deck, all creatures. So for our next video, now let's create a list. We want another 12, we want the best 12. <clears throat> we are looking for creatures predominantly. We want to prioritize creatures because of cards like Warp World and Genesis Wave. We wanna prioritize the creatures. That doesn't mean that we can't include instants or sorceries, but we want to prioritize, we want predominantly creatures for this next for this next subset. We're looking for creatures that when they enter the battlefield, they get us a land into play and or they draw us a card. All right, and we're trying to keep the mana cost as low as possible. So let's hope that we can see each and every one of these creatures and or spells at three CMC or less. So that's what we're looking for, folks. You want the next 12 creatures and or spells that when they enter the battlefield, they get us a land in play or they let us draw a card or maybe both. This is MTG Burgeoning. We're building Riku of Two Reflections. Let me know in the comments below what your next choices were, were, were to be or check us out over at tappedout.net and leave your comments there. Go forth and enjoy your two days if we're talking of Rico of Two Reflections. Want to become a Pack Wars combatant? Four easy steps. 
Step number one, click on the link below in the description or go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash MTG Burgeoning. Step number two, select either membership or support. Membership will enroll you into Pack Wars for $5 each month. Support will cost $5 for one month. Step number three, complete payment information. The name you use will appear on the site. Use your real name, use your YouTube handle, or use no name at all and be anonymous. Be sure to include your email address in the information. Step number four, most importantly, prepare for war.